Mercedes have decided to prioritise the safety of people in the car, even if that means killing more pedestrians. If the choice is between running into a tree and running into a bunch of school kids walking down the street, I'm afraid it sounds like it will do the latter. I'm Katrine de Volder. this is the Practical Ethics Channel. Artificial intelligence is increasingly common in our everyday lives and soon it will be everywhere. Now I'm looking forward to self-driving cars, I think they will be safer than human-driven cars. But this is so, and safer for whom exactly? What if they program to always protect the driver, even if this means that many others will be killed? AI is also used in policing, for example, to identify individuals at high risk of committing a crime. Now, men of color are stopped and searched far more often than white men. Will AI do better? Who will be responsible if it makes a mistake? Colin Gavigan, director of the Center for Law and Policy in Emerging Technologies at the University of Otago, knows all about this. So let's ask him some questions. What is artificial intelligence? What is AI? Yeah, um, that's turned out to be one of the, the trickiest challenges, actually, is defining what, what exactly artificial intelligence means. It's such a trendy buzzword at the moment. It's been claimed for all kinds of things. Um, but it turns out there's no settled definition. Even among people working in the field, there's no settled definition. I think the closest we've come to, roughly speaking, artificial intelligence is what occurs when a, a computer or a computerized system does something that were a human to do it, we would recognize that as involving intelligence. But it covers a whole array uh, from the fairly mundane computer programs doing fairly basic things through to notions of super intelligence. Could you perhaps give some examples of how it is currently being used in a criminal justice or policing? Oh, there's a, there's a timeline of uses through, through, through the policing and criminal justice system. So, for example, in Durham at the moment, they are trialling a tool that uh, predicts the risk of reoffending. When someone is arrested for, for a crime, a decision has to be made about whether that person should be charged and go through the court system, or perhaps dealt with in some other way. Uh, dealt with by um, drug and alcohol rehabilitation, for example, but kept out of the criminal justice system. And that's partly informed by a decision about their riskiness, their dangerousness. This, uh, they're trialling a system at the moment that will use an artificially intelligent tool to, to assess that. So that's at a very early stage before someone is even charged with an offence. We also know uh, that a system called PredPol is being trialled in Kent, Kent Constabulary at the moment. What PredPol does is it attempts to predict which areas in a town will be crime hotspots. So when the police are deciding where to deploy resources, where to deploy police cars on a Saturday night, this will identify areas where they, they think things are going to kind of kick off. Now that's one thing, that's about geographical deployment. The next stage for this kind of predictive software isn't to identify streets and areas, it's to identify individuals. And we know this is happening in the United States at the moment, identifying individuals who it's claimed will be involved or are more likely to be involved in violent criminal activity. The kind of person of interest scenario from that TV show. So what's actually the advantage of AI in this context? What can AI do better than, than humans? One thing it can do is it can assimilate vast amounts of information very, very quickly in a way that humans would really struggle to do. The other thing that's claimed about AI in these systems is that it will be immune to the kind of cognitive biases and logical fallacies that we know affect human decisions. Human decision makers are far from perfect. We, we know this. Um, at, at best, we make kind of careless or, or, or simple mistakes, at worst we can be affected by racist or other prejudiced values. What's sometimes claimed about AI systems is they'll be immune from all of that kind of thing. Now, whether that's actually true is another question. Yeah, because some people are concerned that AI systems to predict crime, for example, could also be racist. Yeah. So why is that or, or what do people mean by that? Well, th there is a concern, a concern that AI systems, which are after all designed by humans, and which will operate by using data from decisions made by humans, historical data from decisions made by humans, will reflect and perhaps kind of bake in prejudiced values to the system. So for example, um, if, if you think about uh, data about arrests in a particular area of town, and if the data shows that, for example, um, non-white young men 
are more likely to be offenders, criminal offenders, than other cohorts. Now that might reflect different things. That might reflect, for example, the fact that police were more likely to stop and search young non-white men. And if you stop and search lots of people from that community, then you'll find more drugs and find more weapons on those people than other people. The AI is only as good as the data set that it's been fed into it. And if that data set is itself kind of affected by racist values, then that's what will pop out the other side. So do you think that then, um, if it is used in the criminal justice system, um, a human being should always take sort of the final decision? That's being suggested. So um, we've already seen in the United States uh, a tool that's been used there called Compass. Now the Compass tool is another thing that, that claims to be able to predict how people will behave in future. If you reoffend, if you'll behave badly. And the Compass tool is used in a whole range of contexts, sentencing, probation, parole, decisions of that nature. This tool has been challenged as being, um, as being racist in the sense that it more often identifies black offenders than white offenders as being likely, as high risk to reoffend, And it gets it wrong in that way about twice as often with black offenders. So it, it, it's about twice as likely to wrongly predict a black offender will reoffend than a white offender. Now that's been challenged in court. The use of that tool has been challenged in the, in the Wisconsin Supreme Court. What the Wisconsin Supreme Court said was, among other things, it's all right to use it as long as the computer doesn't get the final say. As long as a human is kept in the loop, that human makes the final decision. Now what we're interested in looking at in our project is, that sounds great, that sounds reassuring, but how reassured ought we to be by that? How good are human beings at second-guessing the machine? And in that regard, we're speaking to psychologists, and what we're hearing is not greatly reassuring. Um, there's a, a phenomenon known as automation bias, which suggests that when we are operating alongside particularly a very sophisticated computer system, we tend to start deferring to that system. It takes a, it, it's very hard to actually second-guess that system and to say that it's wrong. Imagine even more so if your employer spent millions and millions of dollars on this thing. So the concern is that it's false reassurance in a way. And so um, suppose that prediction is uh, made by an AI system and the prediction turns out to be wrong. Mm. Who's responsible for this? Is it, Can an AI be responsible or is it the developer of the AI or, or the person who had to um, make the final decision perhaps? Yeah, tough question um, because in a sense, if you're dealing with very simple AI tools, we could say that the standard rules about product liability apply. If I sell you a piece of software and that piece of software is rubbish and it doesn't work, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, then you might have some legal redress against me. That's fairly standard. The problem with some of these AI tools is that they use techniques called machine learning. And the whole idea of a machine learning tool is that the form of the software that you buy from the shop won't stay like that forever. It will learn it'll grow, it'll change. Now that's part of the, the, the advantage of AI, that it doesn't, it's not just a static piece of software, it learns and it gets better. But the problem with that is it's kind of hard to know how much that thing can change and still be the responsibility of the person who sold it for you. At some point, that's no longer the thing I sold to you. And that raises all kinds of problems for lawyers in terms of liability when things go wrong. So it's been said that um, AI is a bit of a, a black box, so we don't always know how AI generated its decision. And so, for example, if it's used to refuse um, someone to, uh, in, in the criminal justice system to grant bail or parole yeah. to an individual, I mean, does this violate a right of the individual to know why he was refused bail or parole? He, he might never find out. That's, that's precisely what, what formed the basis of the American court case. So yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. It's, it seems like a basic principle of natural justice that we should be able to understand why decisions have been made about us, because how else do you challenge them? How else do you try and show they're wrong? And, and the black box metaphor is, is very opposite, I think, with regard to AIs. We know what information comes in, and we know what results come out. Well, at best we know those things, but we won't always know what the working was in the middle. So that's, you can't really put an AI in the witness box and interrogate it and demand that it tells you why it made its decisions. Having said that, um, we are, I would say, or I am an AI skeptic, but not an AI cynic. And that's possibly because what we know about human decision makers in these contexts is that they're far from perfect. 
uh, humans are pretty terrible at driving cars. We 1.2 million people die on the roads every year because we're not great at driving cars. And we're not great at making decisions about who to stop and search your arrest. We know that judges are likely to be tougher at sentencing before their lunch than immediately after their lunch. Human decision makers aren't perfect. And it would be unfair to expect, I guess, the AI to be perfect. What concerns me about it, though, is that people expect might expect that it will be. And, and because of this lack of transparency, the imperfections in AI decision-making will be much harder to push back against than they might be with a human. So will people expect higher standards of AI, you think? And, and is this, should we expect higher standards? Or should we yeah, be... Should two we... different questions. The first one, I would say definitely, yes, we will. Um, when it comes to self-driving cars, for instance, I think we're already seeing that any accidents at all are being pounced upon by the media to say, aha, these things are, are not safe. Ignoring the fact that humans kill many, many humans every day in, in driving accidents. And I think it's plausible that we'll expect similar high standards in other contexts like criminal justice as well. Now, should we? Is it reasonable to expect higher standards? Um, that's a tough one to answer. I guess we could say that if there are downsides to using algorithms and AIs, like the lack of transparency, for example, then there should be a corresponding upside. AI should be not just as good as humans, but considerably better to compensate for these greater dangers and risks and downsides they pose. But perfection, that's too much to demand of them. Um, Self-driving cars are also a form of AI. So uh, first of all, are they already being used? Mm, they are. Um, so in, in, the, in the United States, Google and Tesla have, have cars that are that are usable, that are on the roads, have been involved in a couple of high profile accidents already. Although whether those were the fault of the car, the self-driving car or the fault of other drivers has been argued about. But um, yes, they are. Um, more commonly, what's available are kind of dual control cars. So I, I have been in one of these Mercedes E-Series model, which you can sit behind the wheel, your hands in your pockets and the car drives itself. It steers itself, it maintains a nice even distance from the cars in front. Um, but what it requires is that every so often you have to prove to the car that you're still awake and you're still in the wheel. That you have to touch the steering wheel or something of that nature to prove that there's a human still again in the loop. And, and so why is, why is that actually? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it, it may be just because we are not psychologically ready yet to hand over control to the cars. I would say for the moment, I um, wouldn't be trusting them 100% because uh, they have to learn. The car we drove in, I think, would have been a very good car to drive in the, the German Autobahn, but in small New Zealand back roads, not so much. It struggled a little bit with, with, some, of, with some of those. Um, but again, the same issue that I alluded to in the context of criminal justice kind of com comes up here. Is there a degree of false reassurance? Because um, I think, and the psychologists we, we've spoken to have confirmed this, it's very difficult, very difficult to remain in this state of being um, inert but alert, right? So you're sitting doing nothing, and in a long journey, potentially, you're doing nothing for hours, but you have to be ready to jump in at a moment's notice if, if the car malfunctions in some way. I think we're really going to struggle to do that. Um, but yeah. at the moment, it's, it's perceived, I think, to be to be safer and more reassuring than having the car drive itself. Perhaps there's also a danger that we might actually lose some navigation skills. Yeah, I'm absolutely sure that the part of my brain that, that used to remember phone numbers doesn't exist anymore because who needs to? Um, and there is a phenomenon uh, called People sometimes call it things like um, judgmental atrophy. So if you don't use these kind of skills anymore, then they tend to kind of, you tend to lose them, right? It's kind of use them or lose them scenario. So the notion that you could um, not actually have to drive for, for a prolonged period, but still somehow be able to jump in and do a good job is questionable. But we can apply that across all of these other contexts too. Um, this human in the loop in the criminal justice context, in the policing context, in courts, the same problem may arise. If people aren't routinely making these decisions and exercising these mental muscles, if you like, then they get weaker and we get worse at making those kinds of decisions. Another issue arises, I guess, with um, self-driving cars is um, how should they be programmed? Should they be programmed in a way hmm. that always uh, gives priority to the interests of the driver? Yeah, that's that's a massive one. So this has um, come to people's attention because Mercedes publicised the fact that they're priority is going to be the safety of the driver or the people in the car. And this is obviously for philosophers and ethicists, this is, is a fantastic example of a kind of a, 
I suppose you'd say it's like a trolley problem, but where the trolley makes the decision. Um, most real life trolley problems with humans, the law doesn't take much interest because if you have a split second decision, do this or do that, the law tends to be quite forgiving. You don't have time for a lot of reflection and a lot of ethical weighing up of pros and cons. But we're now in a different situation because the programmers of these cars can make the decision in the cold, dispassionate light of day and then load up those decisions into the car. Now, Mercedes have decided to prioritise the safety of the people in the car, even if that means killing more pedestrians. If the choice is between running into a tree and running into a bunch of school kids walking down the street, I'm afraid it sounds like it will do the latter. Um, ethically, that's questionable. Um, from a business point of view, would you buy a car if it wasn't going to prioritise you and your children's safety? Would anybody? So I think that's partly what's informing their decisions there. So um, so how is AI currently regulated and um, is there a need to change current regulation? Well, we're just at the, the commencement of a, a three-year project that's going to hopefully answer that question to an extent. There isn't one body of law that applies to AIs. There isn't one regulator that applies to AIs. And one of the suggestions has been maybe there ought to be. Maybe we need a regulator, independent regulator, who will evaluate these algorithmic tools, partly for accuracy, partly to see if they are deliberately or otherwise um, racist or incorporating other values that we think are really problematic. So that's one suggestion. Um, there have been other suggestions. There's been a suggestion from the European Union, or not a suggestion now, but a directive, that people should have a right, a legal right, not to be subject to decisions by automated processes if they don't want to be. So a legal right to have a human in the loop. And again, we're interested in looking closely at that to see if that kind of thing would be helpful.